Hi, John LaRue here from the Beaverbrook Art Gallery. And given this extremely challenging time going on in the world right now, and certainly down in the United States, uh, there's a lot of racial tension going on, we thought it would be very appropriate to actually talk about an exhibition that we featured here at the gallery two years ago. It was one of the first Black History Month exhibitions we had, and it was done in collaboration with the New Brunswick Black History Society. And so we've invited Graham Nickerson here to talk about this, who is the curator of the exhibition. And and it was a show called Overlooked, and it dealt with uh, two artists. One was a uh, really renowned New Brunswick artist who New Brunswickers should know far more about. His name was Edward Bannister, and he's considered the first really significant uh, black American artist. And the other was a work uh, called Private Roy done by Molly Lamb Boback, done in World War II. Uh, it's one of the few rare depictions uh, of a black individual during the war. And so I want to pass over to Graham to talk to you about these works. And, and hopefully in the future, uh, the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk to you about a few other works in our collection that, that maybe push the envelope. We can talk less just about pure aesthetics, but about things that deal deep with social issues and, uh, and certainly with some racial history as well. So thanks very much. Off to you, Graham. Edward Bannister was born in the early 1800s in St. Andrews, New Brunswick. And so the interesting thing about his life is that he represented a large black community that no longer exists. If you were to visit St. Andrews today, the black community is actually, for the most part, under the Algonquin Golf Course. So it is a, a piece of history that's now been erased. And so Edward Bannister, in the 1840s, like many um, British subjects at that time, they see better prospects in the U.S. and they move on to live there. And so Edward Bannister is a sailor first, and then he ends up living in Boston. And during his time in Boston, he marries and becomes an artist and a photographer. And Unbeknownst to authorities, he's also part of the Underground Railroad and is spiriting blacks up into Canada. So he's more um, of a civil rights hero, um, to me at least, than he is simply an artist. How is Edward Bannister measured in American art history? He is ranked as one of the number one African American artists of his times. So he is an inspiration to further people of color who created art, and he, he basically led, uh, led the path for successive generations of black artists. Edward Bannister was a successful artist, but that isn't to uh, undermine the hurdles that he faced. So he was, uh, in 1867, a New York Herald critic quipped that Negro seems to have an appreciation for art while being manifestly unable to produce it. Disproving that opinion, Bannister's painting, Through the Oaks, won first prize at the 1876 Philadelphia Centennial Exposition. But upon hearing that the artist was black, the organizers attempted to rescind the award. So after his death, Bannister was virtually uh, forgotten for almost a century. But uh, that's in Canada. In the U.S., there's now a Bannister Art Gallery in Rhode Island. Why do you think he's not known uh, very much in, in New Brunswick or in Canada? Well, the, the times of Edward Bannister, there's a lot of social change that Canada is not particularly willing to acknowledge the ramifications. And we're not talking just about black people. Although blacks see a massive decrease in their political power during the 1840s through Confederation, you have a massive migration of Irish and Italians and European immigrants into Canada, or what would be Canada, and that really sort of dilutes the blacks and the loyalist population in general, so that they have very little political say. And so What's also going on is that we, we see an alignment of, of the maritime provinces into what would be Canada, which massively displaces large numbers of maritime people, both white and black. 
And the third thing regarding that issue is that Canada doesn't really like to acknowledge that that in, in the 19th century, the prospects for blacks were much higher in places like Boston than they were here in the Maritimes. And most people who, blacks who managed to achieve any sort of um, measure of success had to go to the U.S. to actually capitalize on their achievements. So the other piece of art that we showed during that exhibition was Private Roy by Molly Lamb Boback. And in this piece, uh, you see Boback's treatment of her subject as a human being. And you see the strength of Private Roy and and some I would read as like fatigue, and social, the, the stress of social interaction with all of the white soldiers that she has to deal with from, from day to day in the 40s and with those attitudes. And so um, Private Roy, if you compare her to other art of the time, she is treated as a human being. And her name as being included in the, the title of the artwork is even that in itself uh, a departure from the way artists tend to treat black subject material at that time. Um, As I said, they would often just say a black woman behind a bar, but Molly yeah. Bobak doesn't yeah. do that, right? Negress tending bar, or yeah. some, like something along those lines. Or, and, and she's fully clothed, and she's not in a submissive position, and there's not no signs of Africa, palm trees, and pineapples. Mm -hmm. or, and there are all of these sorts of things. And if you take a look at um, popular artwork, look at, a, at, a, at the rendition of a black person in film, or in cartoons and what they look like at that time. And you will get to appreciate just how how much more empowering Bobak's treatment of her subject is compared to society's view of black people, and especially black women at that time. The depiction of, of black individuals at all at that time in the 40s was next to nil in Canadian art, right? It, yeah, you're, there's essentially an absence of, of blacks in Canadian art in, in society in general, really. Uh, so it it does make, it's hard to really understand now without the assistance of historians to contextualize it, but it really is a progressive statement in, in and of itself that she's depicted this black woman, used her name, shown her in and what it can't be depicted as like a subservient role. She's a human being making her own way, showing her emotions. Uh, so one of the one of the stereotypes about black people that tends to carry on in in, um, in the white narrative is that we don't have emotions. And so oftentimes, and this carries over from slavery, in, in that as a slave could not show how you felt about anything, otherwise you're getting beaten. So often there's this one of the ways that whites sort of denigrated black people was that they have this mask, you know, the unemotionless mask, and you, they're not human because you can't, they don't feel emotions like we do. And so at one sort of stroke, no pun intended, Bobak really sort of makes this person you can tell when you look at this artwork, she's not particularly pleased in, with her day. Whatever happened, whatever she went through that day, she's tired and frustrated and, and, not, and not just a subservient character. Yeah, she's real. She's a real person. A real person who's had a really tiring day and is just sitting down and, and contemplating what's next. So, Graham, what do you think institutions like the Beebrook Art Gallery can do to improve dialogue and just develop some understanding at a time where I think the world really needs more understanding and empathy? Well, providing a space that's free of the colonial image of black people and First Nations is a step in the right direction. And what we need to do is we need to get people who are struggling with what this entire movement is about. Um, you can go into this gallery now and you can see on the on one side you're going to see you know images of, of black servants and slaves 
but you're also now showing contemporary imagery of black people who are in power. And what needs to continue to happen and how we expand on that narrative is to show exactly what it is that we've overcome. Because oftentimes when we speak, we're just not heard. And so the number of allies we, we continue to bring to ourselves who help to share our perspective and why people are so frustrated with the system and how slow change has come, that's, that is, it's gonna make a change.